Let's see. Hello and welcome to today's Friday Friendly on sustainability. It is on the back of our Make Your, National Make Your Mark ballot. We're in 2020, the um, getting rid of plastic pollution was third in the vote. And in 2020, climate change was top of the young people's priority. So we're talking about sustainability today. We have three fantastic guests. We'll introduce them very shortly. But first, I will remind you that if at any time you're struggling with the connection of the live, just pause it, let it buffer for about 10 seconds, and then hopefully it'll start back up. If you have any questions, just put them in the chat box and then hopefully we can answer them. And if you have to leave at any point, you can rewatch the video and then you can have your, answer, your question answered then. OK, so we'll have our three guests. So first of all, we have Hazel, if you'd like to introduce yourself, Hazel. Hi, I'm Hazel Clatworthy and I work for the council as their sustainability policy officer. Uh, I've been doing it for a long time, uh, about 20 plus years, um, but I do all sorts of stuff to do with sustainability, climate change, plastic free and that kind of thing. It's good to be here. <laughs> Uh, next, we have Sue. If you'd like to introduce us, introduce yourself, Sue. Hello, everybody. I'm Sue Parkinson. I am the County Council's um, Green Infrastructure and Litter Education and Awareness Officer. So I'm particularly um, here to talk to you today about litter. And Rebecca. Hello, I work with uh, these guys. Yeah, so I, I work for Monmouthshire as well. I've been working here a long time. I'm the council's reuse and recycling officer and um, I, at the moment uh, we're doing a lot uh, with our reuse shops at the, re um, the recycling centres, what, what, what old people would call the tip. There we are, that's me. And I'm Elliot from Monmouthshire Youth Service. I'm a youth support worker, mostly based in Abergavenny, Caldecott, Monmouth. I'm sort of a travel man everywhere. So hopefully some of you all know me from the centres. Uh, we're going to have three presentations from each of our guests about exciting topics and hopefully you'll be able to learn something and ask any questions that you have and hopefully we'll have start a conversation about sustainability in Monmouthshire and hopefully get the ball moving on some things. So we're going to start off with Hazel um, who's going to have a presentation and I'll let her introduce it herself. I'll just share my screen now. OK, so uh, that logo at the top is our climate emergency logo. And um, back in 2019, the council agreed that we were facing a climate emergency. So we've got an action plan to try and pull together all the kind of work that we're doing to reduce our carbon emissions and try and tackle climate change. There's a whole load of different uh, actions in there. I'm just going to talk to you a little bit uh, today, just briefly about one of the actions that we're working on. Um, as part of our commitments to be towards becoming plastic free. So um, we have also pledged as a council to work towards becoming plastic free. And um, we've got really proactive groups in each of our towns as well who are working with, you know, shops and retailers and community groups and stuff to reduce uh, all sorts of single use plastics, um, things like disposable cups and bottles. Um, but the project that I've been working on particularly involves uh, period products. So every year for the last couple of years, we've had a big grant from Welsh Government for period dignity uh, funding. And um, we took the decision last year that we wanted all of that money to be spent on products that were either reusable or were as you know virtually plastic free uh, as they could be. Um, and so this lady here, you can see her name is Ella Daesh. Um, she's a brilliant uh, force for change. Um, she's there uh, holding a, a tampon made entirely from uh, applicators that she has found on beaches uh, over uh, the last couple of years. Um, and she's done a brilliant job of campaigning. You know, she's she's worked with us as a local authority to help us decide what companies we're going to use to supply the products that, that we're giving out. She's done lobbying of all the big supermarkets 
Procter and Gamble, all the manufacturers and stuff like that, all to raise awareness of the environmental impact from um, period products being flushed away down the toilet uh, and the impact that has on, on our oceans and our rivers and uh, uh, wildlife generally. So um, there's sort of lots of different alternatives and I know everyone is different and uh, some people prefer to use disposables, some people prefer to use reusables, but I think there's a lot to be done to kind of help people understand uh, what options are out there because, um, you know, you think about your Tampax and things like that, they're such big multinational companies with, you know, massive budgets who really kind of aggressively push their products. And so you could easily go into a supermarket and think that was all that was on offer. That's all that's available. But actually, there are loads of alternatives, um, both reusable options and disposable options that are a lot more environmentally friendly. Uh, and that's what Ella's campaign is all about, to try and make people aware of the, the different options. Um, so um, if you look on that little picture on the right hand side, you know, a simple decision, only 6% of a tampon is plastic. Uh, whereas 90% of a disposable pad is plastic. But then, of course, you know, people like Tampax, they think that people need plastic applicators. So instead of using a cardboard applicator or no applicator, they use a plastic one. And that's what uh, are being washed up on beaches everywhere. So there's lots of different alternatives. Um, so I've got some pictures there on the left hand side. There's lots and lots of companies that make um, washable pads. Um, and they come with a little waterproof kind of bag like that. So if you were out and about, you would use them. Then you put the dirty one in your bag. And then when you get home, you'd give it a rinse and you just pop it in with your ordinary wa washing. You know, it doesn't need anything uh, special. You know, there's nothing dirty about periods. Um, so that's one option that uh, a lot of people find works for them. Um, personally, I have not used washable pads, but I have brought up two children using washable nappies similar um similar kind of process washing them soaking them you know it's just a case of trying it seeing how you get on uh, and i think it's quite easy to adapt uh, to the way you know you just get used to doing things differently after a while and then on the right hand side we've got a menstrual cup so there's a few different companies moon cup and, and lots of others who make those so the that's a different kind of principle again so the idea is that is kind of folded and inserted inside you and that cup then captures uh, captures uh, the period uh, blood and then you pull it out using the bit at the bottom and rinse it in the sink and, and pop it back in again. So that's the cup option. Um, and then also we've got period pants as well. So they have an extra kind of layer sewn into the bottom of them to make them uh, really absorbent. They're, you can wear them all day. You don't need to change them every, you know, three or four hours like you would uh, a pad. Uh, they're absorbent enough to be able to wear them all day. And again, you just uh, would give them a rinse at the end of the day and pop them in with your normal washing. Um, so that's another option that a lot of people find. You know, you haven't got the bulkiness there. Um, if you're wearing, you know, leggings or whatever, um, they're probably even more subtle than the pads might be. But I know that uh, reusables are not going to be for everybody. So if you use disposables, there's just a few really important things to think about. You know, um, think about can I reduce the amount of plastic on what I'm using? Don't go for the Tampax uh, with their plastic applicators or other equivalents. You know, if you want an applicator, try and look for a cardboard one. Um, more and more companies are marketing um, organic or plastic free kind of products, things like time of the month. Uh, they're in my local Tesco's um, and they are organic and they're made in Wales as well. It's a Welsh company. Um, but probably the most important one there is um, what you do with it when you finish it. No matter what it says on the label, you know, it, it might say biodegradable or bioplastics or whatever. Don't flush it down the toilet because ultimately it will end up in the ocean. Um, you know, every time we get heavy rain, the sewage plants and things can't cope. Uh, and you know raw sewage gets pumped out far at sea and then it gets washed back up on the beach so bag it and bin it whatever kind you're using don't flush it a um, couple of things to, to think about too so we've offered these uh, reusable um, products and also the 
disposable ones to all the schools in the county um, for free to give out to anyone who, who needs them, who wants to use them, who wants to try them. So ask your local school uh, if you would like to see samples of things. And then we've also given a lot of the reusable samples to a local community group based up in Abergavenny, but they're working around the whole county called Sustainable You, Sustainable Me. And they're doing workshops uh, with groups all about what the different options are, what the environmental impacts are, um, all about the different reusable products. And they've also got free samples of reusable pads and cups and pants uh, to give away to people to use and to try and see how they get on with it as well. So if you follow them on Facebook or their Instagram account, you can find out um, when the next workshop is going to be. I think there's a couple of dates coming up later on in June. At the moment, they're being done online. Uh, so it's easy to join in. So that's something to look out for as well if you want to find out a bit more information. And then lastly, just a couple of things completely unrelated to periods now, um, but things that I'm involved with that I think you might be interested to hear about. The first one is the libraries of things. So we've had a, a big grant from Welsh Government for reuse and repair type projects. So we're about to, in a few weeks time, open in each of the four main towns um libraries of things you can borrow um for just like one or two pounds for a week um so we've got things like tools gardening equipment camping equipment we've got gazebos for if we've got events we've got folding chairs and tables we've got trimmers we've got you know loads and loads of different things uh, speakers and sound systems and things like that that you can borrow so that's something to just look out for and also if you've got things at home that you never use um you know, tools that you've bought or I don't know, your parents might have something that they bought for the garden they've never used since and they, you know, might be willing to donate it. We can donate things to the Library of Things too. And alongside those, we're also hoping to have repair cafes. So we've already got repair cafes running in Abergavenny and Monmouth once a month, although they've been on hold, obviously, through lockdown. They're starting up again soon. Um, and the idea is you can take along stuff that's broken and someone will be able to fix it for you. So we've got volunteers uh, just basically lending their skills and expertise for free to reduce waste and stop us throwing stuff to, stuff away. So it might be electrical things you've got problems with or clothes that need fixing or um, IT things that need something doing to them or your bike brakes are sticking or whatever it might be. So that's going to be something really exciting now lockdowns kind of uh, easing off a bit to look out for repair cafes um, and we're really keen as well for volunteers who um, you know want to get involved so if that's something you're interested in uh, we'd love to hear from you if if you'd like to sort of help out with one of those projects. So that's it from me I will uh, hopefully end my slideshow now hang on has it gone away or am I still sharing my screen? No you're fine there I think it's just you now. Um, we have a few questions in the chat box. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I think it was definitely a topic that I think is definitely current at the moment, especially with um, Scotland and their approach to menstrual products, um, like giving, like giving them like free in schools and that sort of thing. Um, so our first question is that um, aren't reusable period products unclean? So I think um, in terms of like the dams and stuff like that, is it a case um, they're associated with being unclean, maybe like the thought of rewashing them and stuff like that. Um, so what are your thoughts on them being perceived as unclean? OK, I think there's perhaps, um, uh, you know, perception that periods are dirty and there's something, you know, dirty about periods, but um, that's not the case. You know, there's nothing kind of unhygienic about having a period. I think when things are called sanitary products, that makes it sound, you know, like it's something dirty that needs cleaning up. But actually there's very little blood in in what comes out in period blood. It's actually the actual amount of blood is, is very small. Um, and, you know, if you cut yourself and you, you bled on your clothes, you would wash them, you know, you'd get the stain out, you'd wash them and, and you wouldn't worry about it. So um, I don't think there's any reason why um, periods should be regarded as sort of dirty. I mean, the um, the pads would all have kind of washing instructions with them, which would say what kind of temperature that you'd need to wash them at um, to, to get them clean. Um, 
if you soak them sort of sooner rather than later, it's always going to be easier to get them clean. Um, and the cups, you know, it's just sort of silicon, like medical grade sort of silicon rubber. So it's easy to clean. Um, it wouldn't absorb anything or, you know, so just running it under the tap, you know, or giving it a swill in hot water from the tap, that would be fine. So it, it wouldn't, you know, it's smooth. It's not going to be kind of harboring germs uh, or anything. So I, I don't think I don't think it's going to be a problem. Yeah, I think part of that um, prob well, the issue that they have, I think, comes from just sort of the stigma of it in that, like you said, it's not necessarily unclean. And like saying sanitary sort of makes it seem like it's not a very clean thing but in fact it's natural and obviously every, almost half of the population sort of go through it don't they so um we have a few more questions that i'm gonna mm -hmm. sort of send you away um we sort of had one answered by how we can access them in school um mm -hmm. do you know what department in the schools that have been handed them out or where they can get them um, I think one question here mentioned that they have to sort of get them from the reception in the school or do you know if the schools have them sort of in the bathrooms or something like that? Do you know how they are accessed in school? OK, that's a really, really good question. And I think it's one that we haven't really kind of nailed quite yet. So um, because there was a real rush for the kind of money to be spent for the Welsh Government deadline, uh, we had to place our orders and then um, they were all delivered huge quantities, you know, pallets and pallets of stuff. And then um, we hadn't kind of really worked out the logistics of how to get them to the schools and what the best way to store them would be and how they're going to distribute them. So I can't say categorically how schools are managing that. And that's something that I think that we need to work on. And so we've been chatting to Ella and also the sustainable you sustainable me people about doing some workshops um, over the next half term before the summer in schools to kind of raise awareness of the issues and, and chat to to people about uh, you know their conceptions of you know periods and what would work for them and so we get a better understanding of how people want to get products because you know the that you you just want to make it easy for people don't you you don't want people to be embarrassed about having to go and ask a certain person and it's also it's varied the, the uh, take up from the different schools some schools have said great and asked for you know lots of reusable products other schools i i expect it didn't the kind of order form thing probably didn't go to quite the right person who kind of understands it all and who maybe was just thinking about space and storage and stuff and they haven't got so many, but the sustainable you sustainable me workshops, um, they've got lots of the products. So if you find you ask in school and you can't find out, um, then sustainable you sustainable me would be another place to go. Um, but it's a really good point, and it's something that hopefully these workshops we've got coming up over the next half term will address. Because then I think we'll have a better idea of the best way to get them out. We want. Them, it, we just want it to be really easy for young people to be able to get the things that they need. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think it is an important question and I think it's a case of I think watch this space. I think in hopefully with the workshops and that sort of thing it will come out and hopefully if you have sort of any suggestions of how you think is best um, for you to access them in school, that sort of thing. Um, I think if you let us know, that would be great. And then hopefully we can take that forward then into the workshops and then in, with, in discussions within schools. Um, uh, we've got, I, I think we'll go with sort of two more. Um, I think one of them is discussing sort of how we're in like period knickers might sort of be unhygienic or undignifying um, and sort of, I, what are your thoughts on that or sort of maybe the alternative to wearing sort of period knickers because I know they're sort of um, coming popular aren't they now with like places like Primark selling them. Um, yeah. So your thoughts on that? Yeah, I like I say, I have to confess, I've never tried them myself, so I don't know. Um, but I, you know, a friend of mine has got teenage daughters uh, and they wear them and get on really well with them. I guess. Um, you know, maybe it's worth thinking about trying them at home when you're not really going anywhere, maybe over the weekend, perhaps or whatever. I know um, 
the one lady who was involved in the sustainable me, sustainable you, sustainable you, sustainable me project. She took the opportunity over lockdown of not going anywhere to kind of try things out at home because it's always it's going to be harder, isn't it? Perhaps if you're in school and you're using sort of public toilets and stuff, you're not going to be able to kind of rinse stuff in the same way that you would want to. And that kind of thing, you, the last thing you want is a leak or an accident or whatever when you're out and about. So maybe, you know, try something at home um, when you're not going anywhere and see how you get on. Um, they they say you can wear them for a whole day, they, but I haven't tried them myself to know. So I guess it might depend on how heavy your period is or what point in your period you are as well. They do come in different sort of absorbencies depending on, um, you know, if you need heavy or light or medium kind of flow. So you might want to adjust which ones you're wearing when, or maybe even if you just um, use them in conjunction with a, dispo a washable pad, at, you know, for heavy times, and maybe just try the pants at uh, light times, like at the beginning or the tail end of the period. That might be worth trying as well. Thank you. Uh, we have just had a few more questions, which I think are some really good questions. So one of the questions was sort of this, was, I think will be a quick answer, but is how many times can you sort of reuse the reusable products? Is there sort of a certain amount of times you can use them or is it sort of a, it'll come on the packaging and tell you how many times you can use them? Well, I, I think the pads, you could use them for 10 years, you know, you know, they'd wash again and again. Uh, Sue, who you'll be hearing from later, her daughter is a few years older than my two girls. Um, so she had washable nappies um, and I bought the washable nappies secondhand off Sue and I used them for two of my children and they're still up in the attic if anyone wants them. So, um, you know, they've. The, I know it's not the same as the pads, but the principle is the same. Um, you know, they're designed to be washed in a washing machine um, and you can use them over and over again. So. In, you know, that's another thing that's worth thinking about as well, the kind of financial side of things. You know, you buy a box of pads or whatever for a, a pound or two a month. It, it, it soon adds up over the years, whereas once you've got a, a set of reusable pads, that's it. And you won't have to buy any more again for, you know, years. So um, definitely financially, I think it's worth thinking about. The, the knickers, I, uh, the pants, I, I don't know. But I would imagine that, you know, they would last probably, well, I'm thinking about normal pants from Marks and Spencers. You know, after two or three years of washing, you know, they start going a bit saggy, don't they? Elastic starts going a bit and they start wearing a bit thin. So I'd imagine that the same sort of principle would apply. I'd imagine they'd last, you know, a few years and then would start, you know, fraying around the edges a bit. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. You answered our next question as well about sort of... Um with period poverty being such a big issue, um, this young person said that, would you encourage non-reusable period products at a lower cost over reusable um, to combat the issue and make it more accessible for all? And I think you've answered that in saying that it is more cost effective to use reusable products um, as, as opposed to keep buying the single use ones. Um, especially as you that. can get them, especially as you can get them free from school, because obviously it's a bit of a it's a bigger outlay to get reusable products up front. Um, but once you've got them, that's it. But but if you're getting them free from school, then, you know, it's worth a try. I'd say, you know, try it and see how you get on. And the last question is, do you would you do you think we'd be able to eradicate single use period products in the future? and only use reusable for sustainability or do you think it will always be a choice between one or the other? I think in reality it'll always be a choice probably because you know I've talked about nappies and I used uh, washable nappies but occasionally if I was like going on holiday or out for a day trip or something I'd use a few disposables just because you know it suited me at that time and I think you'd probably find that it would be a similar situation for a lot of people. They would probably be, you know, quite happy with reusables, but sometimes they might want to use disposable. And in reality, you're always going to get some people who are a bit squeamish or a bit icky about the idea or who don't want the hassle of washing them, or maybe they haven't got e easy access to a washing machine. You know, maybe they'd have to take it to the laundrette and they wouldn't want to do that. Or um, So I think there's always going to be um, a need for both, probably. But we can definitely 
do more to reduce the environmental impact of the disposables. And, and like I said, thinking about, um, you know, making sure that we don't flush them away. That's the other really important thing. So going for as plastic free disposable as you can and not flushing them. Thank you, Hazel. I think that was brilliant. And I think it's definitely a topic that is sort of current at the moment. And I think especially with like period uh, poverty being so large at the moment, I think it's definitely something to consider. And I think it's um, definitely if you want to get in touch with your school, I think it's definitely something that you could get in touch with them, try and find out where you can get them from and hopefully have a go yourself with the free products that they have. Um, and definitely let us know if you struggle with your school, if your school have been really helpful, anything that you can let us know about how accessible it is for you will benefit not, not only you, but also all of the other students in the school. Because what we want to make sure is that we're putting on these schemes and everyone is trying really hard, but we want to make sure that they are actually reaching every people rather than just a tick box to say that we've contacted the school and got it done. So thank you, Hazel, I really appreciate that. Um, so uh, we're now going to sort of just talk about what we've been doing as a youth service. Um, so this week we have been doing a litter pick as chosen by E2C with all our centre staff and the young people in the centres. Um, we have been doing them in Caldicott, Monmouth and Abergavenny. So we've done at least two days, I believe, at each site. Um, it's going to lead on a minute to the presentation Sue is on about. Um, we had a conversation two weeks ago when we were talking about what most litter was that we kept finding and the things we kept finding were cigarette butts um, and energy drinks. So either the, the single use plastic bottles or the cans and that was the main thing and we visited um, like local parks um, around the centres um in all three of the sites so that was those were our main sort of um interest i've just seen that there was one last question for hazel i believe wasn't there um i'll just get that up now hazel apparently is very requested from uh, our young people um brilliant that's brilliant so we've just um sort of had somebody ask whether we can stock the reusable um sanitary products in our youth centres um, so hopefully that'll be something that we can do and it's definitely something that will make accessible for everyone because that's I think a brilliant um, alternative to if you can't get it in schools. Um, so right, I'm going to pass on to Sue now who has a presentation and I'll let her introduce her topic while I slowly fade into the background. <laughs> Hello everybody and, uh, and thank you. I, it's it's um... Oh, it's just great to be able to come and talk to you. I, I, it's, it's, um, we don't get many opportunities to talk to um, young people and it's really, really appreciated. And um, thank you also for going out and doing a bit of litter picking over the last week. You've had a lovely weather to do it in. Um, we have to do it in all sorts of weathers. Um, so, uh, but thank you, it's really good. Um, cigarette butts are the commonest item that are found everywhere. Um, is the most common item that anybody finds in um, when they're doing a litter pick. Um, and you might think, well, what's litter got to do with sustainability? Well, um, the thing is that uh, litter doesn't, you know, litter doesn't need to be thrown on the ground. There are bins provided, it, things could be recycled. If we could go into my um, presentation, Elliot, that'd be really good. Um, I can't. That's I can't fine, I'll share it now, don't you worry. Lovely, thank you. Um, yeah, one of the important aspects is that very little litter is actually recycled. So to me, litter is the biggest waste of resources um, because it's not likely to be recycled. It's an enormous waste of money to have to pick it all up off the ground when it could have been put in a bin and, just, and disposed of there and we could have collected it out of a bin rather than being, picking it up off the ground. And it also, it's also a huge waste of volunteers' time in collecting it. Most volunteers would much rather be doing something else and not picking up litter off the ground. Um, so yeah, so litter includes litter from litter bins and what's picked up from roads and public spaces. I would guess that probably 75% of it, what has been thrown as litter could have been recycled if it had been disposed of at home and put in the proper place. Now that's a lot of lot of resources to lose. And when we live on a planet with finite resources, um, 
you can imagine that um, you know littering is a big sustainability issue. So um, the, the pictures on this slide, by the way, are a litter pick that we did. Um, I don't know, probably about two months ago when the, just just before the weather turned nice. Um, we went out, we had some complaints about the road which runs down the back of the um, the service station in Raglan on the A40. And there's a road that runs down the back of it, which goes between Raglan and Monmouth. And we had, we had a lot of complaints about it because people obviously, they drive, they drive out of the service station and they just throw their litter out of the windows of their cars as they leave the site. And the, the, it was just strewn all the way down the the the, um, the roadside verges in the hedges. There were sheep with lambs in the fields. People were worried that the lambs were going to get um, um, injured and hurt by all the litter that was being thrown. So rather than just us doing a litter pick, I, I phoned up the service station and said, look, why don't we just do this together? And we, so we we did. We we had there were um, um, five of us who worked for the council. Uh, we spent one and a half hours doing doing this litter pick. There were um, two vehicles involved at either end so that we could put the litter when we collected it we could put it in the vehicles um, and then there were two people as well controlling the traffic because it's quite, quite a busy road so we didn't want to do the litter picking without having the traffic controlled in case we got knocked down by the vehicles and we did it early in the morning um, so that is that is a, the plus the five people that came out of the service station and helped us as well so that was sort of like 10 people plus those that were controlling the traffic you can just imagine the cost involved in doing that, just because people are too lazy and throw their throw their cans and bottles and stuff out of the windows instead of putting them in a instead of putting them in a bin. Um, and it, you know, it, we're constantly thinking to ourselves, why on earth do people litter when they're when they're in litter bins? And the, these are the some of the answers that people have come up with. One is laziness, perhaps people are too lazy to put it in a bin. Perhaps they don't care. Some people do actually say. I don't put my, I, I just throw it away, throw it down because I know it gives someone a job. Someone else is going to pick it up for me. They, you know, my parents have always tied it up after me. It'll give someone a job. Someone else is going to pick it up. And other people that they, they they drop litter maybe because it's like an act of rebellion of sort of sod you against the world or something like that. I don't know. Um, but anyway, it's. Um, it, it does cost an awful lot of money and it's a waste of resources. So we can move on to the next slide. Can everybody see the next slide? Sorry, I can't see that. I can't see the um, I can't see both. So um, what can we do about it? One of the things that the council does most of is about is, is education. We've put up about I don't know, 150, 200 signs in laybys to try to prevent litter. And we're now providing some um, new bins in laybys as well, knowing that those are the places where a lot of people do drop litter and they are working. Um, we've issued press releases and we've done social media posts about litter. A vast majority of people are very sympathetic to the council on this because most people know that littering is wrong. Um, another aspect, of course, of um, stopping people from dropping litter is enforcement. But it, you know, it's re it, it, it is illegal to drop litter, but it is incredibly difficult to find to, to see somebody dropping it. And so actually catching somebody in the act is 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 really very, very difficult. You have to be there and witness it. The same as dog fouling. A lot of people do think that we should as a council have a stronger enforcement policy on littering. Um, some areas employ in what they call enforcement agencies to come in. So they're not kind of council staff. They are employed by by another company, but their staff can be kind of really threatening. And it's it's just kind of it's just not really Monmouth's way of doing things. We have a lot of visitors and tourists in the in the county and we don't want to scare those visitors and tourists away. We prefer to encourage people to behave responsibly because, you know, most people are intelligent. They know what the right thing to do and they can see the damage done by litter. So we want to appeal to their better nature. Um, I'd be interested to know what you think, whether you think that um, we go, you know, we don't do enough on enforcement and we should do more and what kind of things we could do. Um, the, the pictures you can see, there's one picture there of the um, one of the signs that we've put up, um, which is um, says don't mess with mom. We've also had um, um, huge vinyls put on some of our bin lorries. There's one in each of the, our towns. Um, the next picture is of an overflowing litter bin. This is a big problem we had last year um, when lockdown happened. We, uh, sorry, when lockdown was kind of released, a lot of people went to visit our green spaces and um, um, too many people 
and too many people with too much rubbish for the for the bins that we had. And most of the time, the bins are completely adequate. They don't we can't have expanding bins that will um, expand to take the amount of litter that people bring along. And of course, a lot of people bring along things which, um, you know, they're not litter bins are not meant for things like disposable barbecues, for example. People should be taking those kind of things home. If they carried multi packs of beer or whatever to a picnic site, uh, that's not really litter. You should take that kind of rubbish home with you. The litter bin's not really made for that kind of that that kind of um, that kind of waste. And the third picture there that you can see is um, of the um, the amount of litter that was collected by one of our volunteers. He's in his 80s, uh, poor man. He lives not far from the River Wye in Monmouth, and he spends uh, most weekends uh, collecting the litter that is left behind on the, um, you know, the pebble beaches that people go to visit on the side of the River Wye and go and have a paddle and a party and whatever. Um, but they leave all their bottles and whatever down there. And um, so this chap, in his, he's in his 80s because it's because it's not it's not council land. We don't have as a council, we don't have responsibility to go and collect the litter from there. But obviously, if somebody doesn't collect it, it's going to enter the, enter the river and then it will the rivers will very quickly wash it down and it'll enter the sea. So um, this chap who who's um, one of our volunteers, he's absolutely amazing. Um, his name is David Wigmore. Um, so he takes it upon himself to go down there when he walks his dog and collects all the litter up, he separates out all the recycling from the rubbish, um, puts it all out with his household waste um, for our, for the council to um, to come and collect it. He, he's absolutely amazing. We've got several, we, in fact, we've got nearly 300 volunteers altogether. Some of them are like David Wigmore and they're absolutely amazing. They don't just collect the litter, they send, separate it out into the recycling. So that is not a res wasted resource. It's, you know, he spends an awful lot of time doing it, but it's not a wasted resource because a lot of it is recycled. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, can everybody see the next slide now? I can't see both. Um, so there's um, coming along very shortly during the summer holidays, I think, um, Welsh Government have designed a new um, litter campaign. The litter campaign is, is really kind of targeting young people and I, I particularly wanted to know what you what you thought about this and whether you thought we were it was barking up the wrong tree or whether you think it's the right thing to do um so and it's particularly looking at trying to um tackle litter that is thrown from cars onto roadsides and also the kind of litter that's left in beauty spots like that overflowing bin that you saw and the and the kind of litter that was on the on the riverbank that you saw that david wigmore had collected um so it's to tackle all these issues litter left in beauty spots i mean a lot of people I was absolutely astounded. They will um, go to a, um, a garage and buy a cheap tent and um, a disposable barbecue and enough food for the weekend. They will go to a beauty spot. They'll camp, a uh, wild camp then, and leave all of their stuff behind, including the tent, the sleeping bags, clothes, everything's left behind. And, and it, you know, it's a, these places are sometimes they're miles from anywhere. So it's actually really difficult to, to collect the litter from them. Um, and you know, we're at a bit of a loss really to know what to do about it. And um, maybe you have some ideas. It would be great if if we could um, try to tackle some of these 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 new problems which are which are starting to emerge that we've not really seen before in Monmouthshire and elsewhere as well. Um, so, um, I mean, that's kind of coming to the end of, of my presentation. So I particularly want to, you know, I want to ask you a question really as to what more we could do as a council. Are we provide, do we provide the wrong kind of bins? Are the bins in the wrong places? What would make them more attractive to use? Um, what would encourage more people to um, not dispose of their litter irresponsibly and to put it in a bin, um, which would make our lives easier, it would make the, our volunteers' lives a lot easier, and also hopefully um, make it easier for us to recycle the litter. One of the things we are doing, we're trialling um, some recycling litter bins where we're actually collecting the um, recycling as well as the litter kind of separately and we we're, we do some work on some of our vehicles so that we can keep the litter set the sorry the waste separate from the recycling on our on the lorries that collect the, the empty litter bins so hopefully that will make a difference um but yeah i i wanted to yeah i wanted to pick your brains partly as to what we can do that is going to make a difference and um help tackle some of these really difficult problems that we seem to really struggle to to solve and that's the, that's the that's the end of my presentation, really. And any questions? 
thank you, Sue. I think um, in terms of, uh, from me, I know I can't speak on behalf of all young people, but I think when we say like we're targeting young people, it almost mm. seems like, oh, they're the ones definitely doing the littering. It's them that are causing all the mess. And I think it's, um, I think it's important to almost say that it's not, we're not saying that young people are the people. I know like when you talked about the creating a tent and having your disposable barbecue and throwing <laughs> it and just leaving it on the beach. And I definitely know um, adults that have done that. And it's oh, definitely yeah. the older sort Absolutely. of people that do it. I think it's almost important to say that we want our young people to know that it, you know it's not something that you should do and that it's definitely mm -hmm learn to respect your area yeah. and that sort of thing isn't it and almost take pride in Monmouthshire yeah. I know we've got yeah. a we've got that's a beautiful where it county starts haven't from. we um, that's, so, that's, where that's where it starts from is is this a kind of educational message of of um, people being responsible in their behavior and um, you know how do we manage to sustain that over a long period of time yeah so we've got a few questions in the question box Excellent. and I'll um I'll ask you some. Um, so my first, uh, the first one I'm going to read off is, are there any incentives we can use to stop littering rather than punishments? Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, we don't have any at the moment. Um, and yeah, um, there's an organisation called Hubbub, um, which is trialling these kind of ideas where they will, um, for example, if you have a litter bin and when you put something in the litter bin, the, the litter bin will sing you a song or say thank you very much or that kind of an incentive to it's kind of like a fun thing that to, to put your litter in a bin rather than drop it on the street. Um, is that the kind of thing you meant or did you mean something more than that? I'm not sure we'll see now from the question, but I know that we talked earlier about um, cigarette butts being the mm. most popular litter. And I've seen like on social media, like it was quite a while ago, but they had like um, it was like yes or no and stuff like that. That's and it would it. be like it would be like a yeah. question or something like that. And it would be like a almost like a fun way of just putting your cigarette butt in the bin That's and it. then sort of. Yeah, vote for things. Yeah. So like have a vote and sort of make it almost like um, it's quite like a bit of fun in it, like sort of putting your rubbish sort of or putting your cigarette butt in the bin. Um, we've also got. Um, uh, I believe there was something about maybe more recycling bins um, yeah. instead of instead of just put it, just like litter bins because then obviously like I said earlier about the main thing that we picked up on our litter pick was like cans and bottles that could be recycled. Um, so I know that, for example, we were going around sort of Bailey Park and I know there wasn't any sort of recycling bins around yeah. there that I could see or at least near the area that we did. Um, yeah. So can I, I, can I put in? That. Can, I, can, can I put in? Um, uh, the, the Welsh government, um, along with the Scottish government and the UK government, the varying speeds are looking at um, a deposit return scheme mm. for things like cans and plastic bottles. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's, I'm, I've been a bit out of the loop, but it's been slightly delayed with COVID. So all of the great minds and barristers and solicitors looking at how the law they can sort the law out on it to. Um, make the law work. Um, they've been uh, preoccupied with COVID and Brexit. So, um, but deposit return scheme uh, was on the cards just before, um, I think 2019, wasn't it, Sue? So that the it idea was. is you, if you bought a bottle of pop for um, a pound now, a, a small bottle, in the future it might cost you perhaps one pound 20. And then when you give the bottle back, you'd have your 20p back. Mm. So it, it gave a value to what, we see now as litter, it would, it would make us think of it more as a precious resource and actually get some money back for it. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely that on the card. An incentive, wouldn't it? That would provide yeah. an incentive as well, which which yeah. is what something Elliot was asking in the question. Uh, that would provide an incentive to people to um, to take the bottle back rather than dropping it either in a bin or or, or litter it. Um, just to just to answer the question about the recycling, we. Um, we do have one or two recycling litter bins around. Um, our experience of them is that they're not they're not uh, kind of properly used where people and for example, if the litter bin gets full, people will then say, oh, that one's full. I'm just going to put any old thing in the, in the recycling part of it. Um, so that's what that's one 
issue and the other one is that um, our vehicles have not been able to keep the recycling separate but we are like as I said we are trialing that which we're, 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 we're going to um, partition through uh, three of our vehicles I think one in each area so that we can actually try keeping the recycling separate and um, it's something we definitely want to bring in in the longer term and we recognize that it could make a big difference actually to our recycling figures as a county as well so we Brilliant. need to do I think we'll have one last question because then we'll get on to uh, Rebecca's presentation. And I think the last one, I think is quite an interesting topic actually. And it's, um, do you think recycling and reusing waste is the biggest issue that should be taught at school? Or should we be focusing on education on fossil fuels and pollution? Because um, it seems to be that their lessons in school are just mostly about recycling. I don't know if anyone wants to chip in there. Can I, shall I chip in a bit? Yes, of course, Hazel, yes. that'd be brilliant. I think one really important thing to think about is that an awful lot of um, the stuff that people throw away is, so all your plastic bottles, plastic originates from oil, crude oil. So all your plastics have come from crude oil. So anything plastic you throw away, you are contributing to climate change uh, and the whole fossil fuel issue because it's been made out of plastic. Um, the other thing is as well, is that, um, you know, recycling, especially an aluminium can, it takes massive amounts of energy. I can't remember the figures, but huge amounts of energy to extract bauxite, which is the ore that aluminium comes from, massive amounts of energy. So every time you recycle that can, then you're saving huge amounts of energy compared with if you happen to manufacture a new can every time. So I think it's hard to separate the two because, you know, the whole waste and attitudes to waste and recycling are all kind of tied up with the whole resource use of fossil fuel use and energy consumption. Because whenever you buy something, energy has been uh, put into making that product, whatever it is. So if you're just throwing that away, that is contributing to climate change as well. So I, I agree that schools need to have a kind of broad range of stuff and it's perhaps a bit of a you know easy one to just talk about the three r's reduce reuse recycle and it's good to get the broader context um of that though to realize that is kind of contributing to a global issue as well so i think the kind of two need to go hand in hand and it's important to give that bigger context um to what might seem like a kind of trivial thing just littering but if you think about the energy that's gone into and the resources that have gone into manufacturing those things uh, you can see it's all tied up together Brilliant. Thank you, Hazel. I think you answered the question um, excellently there. I think especially with the curriculum, I know it's difficult, you only have so much time, but I think if you just learn about recycling and then you understand the impact that it's making and then it's uh, overall overarching effect that it's having on the environment and then you talk about global warming and that sort of thing i think it's definitely important to know all sides of it and hopefully that'll be something that you definitely learn as you get older because i think when i was younger you start off in school and it's all recycling reduce reuse recycle and then as you get older then you're talking about your sustainability and global warming and how fossil fuels can have an impact on um the uh, global warming um, so we're going to pass on now to Rebecca, who is our last guest with her last presentation. Um, I'll uh, let her introduce her topic and then I'll share my screen so you can see the presentation. Hello, uh, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak to you guys. Uh, before uh, COVID hit, you would uh, mainly find me at the One Planet Centre. That's the local authorities. Uh, uh, education centre at the side of what used to be known as the TIP in Lanfoist, um at, at the Lanfoist Household Waste Recycling Centre. We used to have lots of uh, uh, classy local school children coming in to talk about climate change and um, uh, all of its impacts. So uh, obviously since Covid uh, we haven't been able to do that. Um, so now my role is, uh, my title by the way is uh, reuse and recycling officer um, and that more reflects what I do now I guess. It, um, just before Covid hit we opened our reuse shop uh, at Lamfoist Recycling Centre um, selling items that we've salvaged from the skips. Um, sorry items that uh, we've rescued uh, 
literally pulled out of the skips rather than things that have been donated. And um, yeah, so that shop has been open for two years uh, and it's doing really well. And then yesterday we opened a brand new shop down at Five Lanes uh, Recycling Centre. I can give you the postcodes. I should have sent you those earlier, shouldn't I? Sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, that's what's kept me busy of late. Um, I wondered if we, we uh, uh, might have the next slide, Elliot, please. OK, lovely. So Welsh Government uh, gave us um, uh, some grant money. We were able to apply for a large uh, amount of grant money just before Christmas, and it was all on the theme of uh, reuse. I think they, they awarded about 30 million to Welsh local authorities in a very short space of time just before Christmas, and we could apply for it for to set up this new shop down at uh, Five Lanes Recycling Centre near Cowent. And uh, it also funded uh, repair cafes and food share projects uh, in Monmouth and, and um, the Library of Things all across Monmouthshire. So our uh, reuse shops are a small part of the reuse community all over Monmouthshire. Um, and we got a local artist uh, to try and depict for us, and um, you can see it in this slide here, um, what we were trying to achieve really and just to show you know in a bit of a snapshot um what we were all about so we literally rescue the items like you might see on some of the programs that are popular at the moment money for nothing and things like that um, so we rescue the items we take it down to our little shop down the bottom there um uh, we open in Abergavenny our shop opens on a Wednesday um, and on a new shop down in five lanes we open on a Thursday um and then the profits from the stuff that we sell uh, all goes to um, planting trees in Monmouthshire to increase uh, the urban tree canopy cover uh, to help uh, reduce the effects of climate change. So it's very much a circular um, effort, if you like. And I work very closely with uh, Sue and Hayes and we, uh, yeah, um, yeah, they're, they're the clever ones and I'm the rough one at the skip. So that's me is coming at the end. <laughs> um, what what else can I tell you? Um, if if we uh, have the other, another slide, Elliot, is that all right? And then I'll ramble on a little bit more. Lovely. OK, there. So we're very blessed to have uh, in our uh, Lamb Voice shop uh, about 10 gorgeous volunteers. And there we've got Marilyn. She's a teacher. She does. She teaches English, and when she's not teaching English, she comes to do the dishes for us. So make makes all our uh, um, beautiful. Uh, or, or they start off very dirty glasses and jugs that we drag out of the rubble skip. Last week we had a beautiful jewels mug uh, uh, jug that came out of there, which we managed to sell for twenty pounds. The jug. <laughs> so Marilyn is the one that makes them. She gives them a wash in the bowl, and we laugh because her day job is so pressured and. Um, you know, quite highbrow, and then she comes to do the dishes for us, and, and we're very blessed to have her. And she's so very uh, enthusiastic. We, she's so enthusiastic that we hope now to get Marilyn up on the ramps, what we call it, where the skips are, where people drive in and uh, deposit the rubbish, um, so she can just dive in at the last minute and divert those items when they, you know, between their boot and the skip, that she can not quite rugby tackle them because of COVID. But she can intercept and uh, say, hang on, we'll take that. And um, we're also hoping that her enthusiasm will rub off on our uh, uh, chaps that work on the top there. Um, you can see how it's all winds and weathers and they're not always as enthusiastic as, as some of our volunteers. It's a strange irony that, um, you know, that the volunteers who are doing it for nothing are super enthusiastic. Um, I thought yesterday as we were down on the site, then we had just a little moment between customers coming. Uh, I spotted these two feral cats and the, the chaps who work on the site and Rhiannon, the lady down there, she looks after these. Now, these are not looking very enthusiastic at all, but we've got Maverick on the left and Tyson on the right, who's normally a bit of a scrapper. But these feral cats, they help to keep the rats population down on the sites and um, they're looked after by the staff quite a lot as well. I, the juxtaposition of them being very chilled out and can't be bothered. <laughs> struck me as funny compared to our hard work in our volunteers. So on a serious note, we would love more volunteers. We recruit from uh, Wellbeing for volunteering and I sent Elliot to um, uh, addresses for the two lovely ladies who recruit for us. Um, we'd love some younger volunteers as well. That would be amazing. So if any of you guys listening would like to come and volunteer with us, 
we open on a Wednesday at uh, Abergavenny and uh, Thursday in Five Lanes. But the day before the site opens, we it's usually a, it's, it's evolved into more of a day specifically for volunteers. It's a bit of a calmer day before the crowds come. And um, it's a day for kind of exploring and looking at some of these items that uh, we, we salvage from the skips. Um, if we flip to the next site, uh, the last slide, uh, Elliot, that would be great. Talking about some of these items, they really are <laughs> very strange, some of them. And it seems that every item has a tale to tell. And we spend a lot of our time pondering and puzzling over what some of these things are. What could they possibly be used for? Where do they come from and how did they get there? So um, two of the items that have come in recently, are, um, if we look at the item on the right hand side, the green sh shoes, the spikes on. I thought, what are they? Are they snowshoes to help you, help you along in the snow, not to slip? No, said uh, uh, Martina, our artistic director down at the shop who makes that look beautiful displays. Um, Harvey Nix would be uh, jealous of her, the things she makes. She said, don't be silly. They are to make it put air in your lawn, to aerate your lawn. I knew you would know, so I could see you nodding. I knew you would know. <laughs> So we have lots of fun guessing what these strange and wonderful items are. And, and uh, yeah, these are just two of them. Uh, now, Mickey on the left, he's caused us uh, much excitement. Uh, he's 10 years off being a proper uh, bona fide antique. He's 90 years old and he was made, he was born in a, a, a toy factory in Pontypool called Dean's, Dean's Toy Factory and he's a rag. A Dean's rag mini uh, uh, Mickey but you did have a mini as well so he's without his mini but um, yeah so he's just six inches high and we found him in an old suitcase that got thrown into the skips and one of the boys who's super keen he pulled the suitcase out and opened it up and there was this little fella oh he just just warmed our hearts um, even more so when we found out how much he was worth online <laughs> So you'll find him and a mini in the uh, v &A Museum of Childhood and apparently the Queen was given a set when she was a little girl to play with. Um, so born in the 1930s, he's worth about £300 and he's only six inches high and he's really quite dirty and uh, yeah, uh, need, need, needing to be loved I think. So we haven't, we haven't parted with Mickey um, but um, we did have a lot of fun researching him and um, We've often thought, you know, there would be something nice for the, our younger folk to get involved with, to you know, come and have a look around the shops and have a look, look at some of these incredibly um, fascinating items. All seem to have a tale to tell, and uh, see if they could do some more research on it. Because often we don't have the time; we are busy lugging and chugging things around the site and um, having a right old time, really. But um, you know, we 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 definitely would need. Uh, would benefit from some, um, yeah, younger folk. Okay, have I rabbited on enough now? <laughs> Three years enough from me. I think I, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's brilliant. Yeah, that's Thank a really you. I think um, <laughs> the reuse shops, I think, are an excellent opportunity. In Monmouthshire to have, I think. Um, we're very lucky and I think it's a really cool thing that we can um, offer uh, our people of Monmouthshire and I think if you ever get a spare five minutes, half hour, have a pop down and I think it's definitely a cool place you can see everything they have to offer. Technical difficulties, not working. Um, if we have any questions now for any three of our guests, feel free to put them in the um, chat box and we'll try and answer them uh, as best we can for the last sort of five minutes. Um, but I, I will say a big thank you to all three of our guests. I really appreciate you coming in and speaking to the young people. I think uh, uh, we'll def definitely have some great topic of conversation and learn a lot about what Monmouthshire has to offer for uh, all the people that live in Monmouthshire and all the young people and what they can get involved with and I think it's really um, something sort of exciting that we can get involved with and I know the sustainability in the planet is a massive topic I think that everyone sort of needs to get involved with. So we've got about three minutes left so any questions feel free to ask them um, if not we'll be wrapping up very shortly.
Um, do any of our guests have anything that they'd like to add? Hazel, is there anything that you'd like to plug before you go? Um, I just wondered, one of the questions is about where can I get a litter picker if I want to do a litter pick? So I wonder if Sue could perhaps talk about the litter picking hubs that we're setting up. Brilliant, thank well, you. Spotted, Hazel. I, did, I didn't see that question. I, I can't see the questions, to be honest. <laughs> Um, yes, we we've got um we've got uh, Keep Wales. We work very closely with an organisation called Keep Wales Tidy, who are a charity devoted really to um, lit solving the litter problem and helping people to um, pick up litter in their areas. So yeah, there's two options. If you want if you want to go out litter picking, you can um, you can borrow litter kit from uh, one of our litter picking hubs. If you go to Keep Wales Tidy, Keep Wales Tidy's website. Um, they've got an area on there, um, especially for litter picking hubs, and they've got them all over Wales. And there's a map there, and it shows you where they are in the in in um, in the whole of Wales, including Monmouthshire. Um, and, and we also provide um, litter kit to people as well. At the moment, we've stopped giving it to individuals because we've just got so many litter picking people that um, uh, I'm, it's hard for us to keep up, to be honest with you. Um, but we would like to um, encourage more people to go out litter picking and we can we can loan you litter kit at, um, and then we'll have it back afterwards if you want to do it as a kind of like a one off um, and then we'll come around and, and pick up the litter when you, the bags of litter once you once you're done. Um, so yeah, hope that answers that question. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, what I will do on, after the Friday Friendly is post um, on our socials all of the websites that um, everyone has recommended and where to find them. And then if there's also any links or how to get in contact with everyone, if you have any questions or anything like that, or if you'd like to get involved with anything, it'll be on our socials. Uh, so check uh, MonConnect on Twitter and Instagram and it'll be on there. Um, what we'll do if we have sort of anything else that anyone would like to just final, uh, final things to say from each of you and then we'll uh, sign off. So thank you all for listening. Um, and Hazel, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, not really, just to say, you know, there's been a couple of comments, I think, in the chat about, um, you know, feeling like not sure what to do and how to make a difference. And, you know, uh, it's hard to find the right choices, but there's there's loads of resources out there. I, I put in the link uh, a WWF kind of carbon footprint thing, which tells you simple ideas about how to reduce your carbon footprint and suggestions based on the answers you give. Um, and there's a quote I put in that I really, really like as well um, uh, from a lady. I've forgotten her name, but it says we don't need a handful of people doing zero waste perfectly. We need millions of people doing it imperfectly. So, you know, even if you just make one or two little changes, it really does make a difference because if everyone does that, it will really add up. So don't feel you've got to nail everything, and cut out all your plastic and never drive again and, and whatever. You know, every little bit, if you walk to school one day a week and out of five, brilliant, you know, so those little things do add up. Yeah, I think if any little thing that we can do towards um, creating a better world for ourselves, I think is massive. Um, like even if it's just reducing plastic or if you have sort of a, I don't know, a vegan day where you have a meat free Tuesday or something like that, meat free Monday, um, any little thing that you can do, I think makes a massive impact. And um, if the more people that do these little acts, I think the greater impact we can have all together. Um, Sue, is there anything that you'd like to add? Um, yeah, somebody's asked, uh, I can't tell what's recyclable and um, the County Council, I, I'm hoping on the website, um, Rebecca will answer it better than me. Um, we should have a list of things that you can recycle. Um, so hopefully you, um, that's on the County Council's website, on the recycling waste um, area of the council website. You can actually find out what the can, what the council can take for, for recycling. Um, so don't be put off if you don't know what's recyclable. Yeah, and, and Yes, it, it is on the under the red and purple bag collections. You'll find our list there. Um, for me, the last year, especially during lockdown, uh, it's just been an eye opener of just the small things we can do. I, um, my local uh, park volunteer group, um, we were given some uh, tree saplings by the Woodland Trust. So during this, the, the past winter, I would sneak out almost moonlight with a shovel and a spade and go and put some saplings in and. Um, uh, I, I, to be fair, I was putting them in places that I had permission for, but 
yeah it's really easy to do to to collect some seeds this autumn come in and grow a little sapling in a pot and they grow ever so slowly if you're collecting an acorn or a um a, a you know chestnut a conquer um and yeah once it gets this big then stick it in if you've got a big enough garden pop it in there or if you're collecting seeds from a smaller tree or you get to you know so a meter high contact us and we'll find somewhere in the community that you can plant out this tree everybody most people have got a garden so if you've got a garden get a bit of greenery in your garden that's my top tip <laughs> thank you thank you all so i will say thank you hazel rebecca and sue for joining us i think uh, the young people have been able to have answered a lot of questions and i think hopefully those that are watching back will get in touch with us and hopefully we'll um hope make a better environment for the young people and create more opportunities for them i think it's been a great opportunity for all of us um so thank all three of you for coming um i've really enjoyed it thank you to everyone that's asked questions um to all of us i appreciate you joining in on your friday afternoon during half terms thank you very much um i will say if you have any more questions or anything like that you can get in touch with us using our digital consent form on our link tree and if you want to re-watch this at any time all you have to do is click the link that you joined to watch the Friday Friendly in the first place from our link tree. Um, so thank you very much. That's all from me and from our guests. So thank you very much.